This man's job is one of the most hazardous and most satisfying in the Air Weather Service. He is a United States Air Force Special Operations weatherman. He's trained to parachute deep into enemy territory if necessary, to make weather observations near an infiltration route. Military parachuting isn't a glamorous sport to this man. It's just transportation, another way of getting to work. To avoid detection, this man is using halo, high altitude, low opening technique. He may fall through space for a minute and a half before he deploys his chute. Like all special operations weathermen, he is a volunteer, highly trained in many techniques. He must be resourceful and in top physical condition. Much of his work will be outdoors, in remote areas. He must be able to travel light and to live off the land. Sometimes he will travel with a team. Often he will be alone. He must be capable of independent judgment and instant decision. He may be called upon to make observations for several days or longer to obtain en route weather for a strike on an infiltration route. Much of his equipment is miniaturized so that he can carry his weather station wherever he goes. He sends out information in code. He learns to move around in all kinds of terrain, never staying too long in one place. Or well, the enemy may hear his radio and try to locate him. His rifle is always handy, just in case. To become a special operations weatherman requires unusual self-discipline and stamina and takes at least a year of training. The weatherman learns to use small, lightweight equipment, which can be carried on a backpack as he parachutes into remote areas. The less weather equipment he has to carry, the more he can carry of communication gear, survival equipment, and food rations, all of which are equally important to his mission and his survival. The special operations weather teams are continually called upon to test and evaluate new equipment, developed not only for their use, but also for the worldwide operations of the Air Weather Service. In addition, the special operations weatherman receives intensive training in such areas as combat survival, tropic survival, and sea survival. You will also learn combative measures, a special blend of karate, judo, and other self-defense techniques. He will study radio communications. He is trained as a jump master and becomes familiar with all cases of parachuting, including setting up the drop zone. Special talents and experience qualify certain individuals for training as parachute riggers language specialists, and mountain climbers. Some men will take the Arctic survival course. There's also a swamp rat course for all special operations forces personnel. Officer personnel must complete a combat operations specialist course, which trains them in forward air techniques. One of the Special Operations Weatherman's primary missions is to support the first Special Operations Wing. During a field training exercise, the weather team may consist of only three persons, two enlisted men who act as weather observers, and a weather officer who is a forecaster. 
For this field exercise, they set up a limited weather facility near the operations tent. They take weather observations. They receive additional weather data on surrounding areas by radio. This information comes from military and civilian observers in many nearby localities, trained by special operations weather teams. In addition, they receive by radio teletype weather information on more distant areas, perhaps even from surrounding countries, weather which will affect the task force mission. All of this data is used by the weather officer to prepare a forecast and to brief special operations forces that may include air crews and task force commanders from both the special operations forces and army special forces. The weatherman is assigned to missions all over the world, Europe, Latin America, Southeast Asia. Wherever he goes overseas, he finds himself working among people whose culture and way of life differs from his. He makes a point of learning to understand these people, of respecting their nationality, their traditions. In fact, the more he makes himself one of them, the more the success of his mission is assured. Teaching, training, advising brings him in almost continuous contact with the people. In some cases, he finds it necessary to live among them. In helping a country expand its weather network, our weatherman visits stations of many types. He checks a station that he has had a hand in setting up. He makes sure that the weather reports aid in pilot briefings and that they supply needed forecast information. The weatherman inquires about the remote sites in the network. When an isolated weather station has not been heard from within a reasonable length of time, our weatherman makes a personal visit to the remote site to check on what is wrong. In most cases, such checks reveal that the lack of communication is caused by the failure of equipment. While fixing the broken radio, our weatherman learns of another problem in the district which concerns him. Serious flooding in a nearby village. Taking the only means of transportation available, the sergeant gets to the troubled village as soon as possible. From a local village authority, he learns that the situation is indeed serious. A large supply of the village's food supplies was carried away by the raging flood. The people are not only hungry, but most of them are sick. Investigation revealed that the flood has polluted the well, the village's sole supply of water. First, the sergeant radios for help, an aircraft to bring medical aid and food. While awaiting the arrival of help, our weatherman renders what first aid he can to the injured and sick. He shows them how to boil water from the polluted well to rid it of germs, how to filter out the dirt, how to use iodine tablets to doubly ensure that the water is safe to use. The arrival of the aircraft brings a doctor, a paramedic, and others along with food supplies for the village. The doctor treats the injured and the seriously ill. The medical technician cares for the others. The doctor selects a site for digging a new well to replace the one polluted by floodwaters. Everyone, including our weatherman, lends a hand. Two young men have been selected for training as weather observers to serve the district. One is a school teacher from a nearby district, the other a local man is conscientious but of limited education. Working together, these two men have been trained well enough to supply weather information needed to help plant and care for crops, or to give advance warnings of the buildup and approach of dangerous storms. A working radio also assures the isolated village a means for calling for help when needed.
aircraft, food, doctors, and technicians. Our weatherman has a right to be proud that he's been able to help one of these small villages. Due to such efforts, perhaps one day it will have its own school, perhaps even its own hospital. The special operations weatherman must be able to infiltrate enemy territory when required. He must also be able to exfiltrate, that is, to get out. Weathermen may be exfiltrated by nearby friendly forces or by a friendly helicopter with a jungle penetrator. Sometimes a special aircraft can swoop in for a short field landing on a dirt strip. If there is no other way and conditions are critical, the weatherman has been trained to use the Fulton pickup system. When weather factors are properly used in mission planning, special operations forces are able to complete their missions more effectively. Weather may conceal the movements and engagements of a guerrilla force. Raids, ambushes, and infiltration can use weather to cover friendly units and to hinder the enemy. Weather forecasts are required for airdrops of personnel and equipment, photo and armed reconnaissance, close air support, and interdiction missions. Special operations forces employing air units in counterinsurgency operations depend on the special operations weather teams to provide this support. Uh -huh.